Good morning, and thank you for joining us today at exciting Central Tampa Baptist Church here located in Tampa, Florida. 
Welcome to our morning service. We pray that your week has been a wonderful and blessed one. Psalm 133.1 reminds us of how good and how pleasant it is when we dwell together in unity. And this morning we want to welcome you, each and everyone, wherever you are listening online or in person in our service this morning, welcome. We hope today that you would have a blessed, blessed, wonderful time with us. If you're joining us for the first time, you're especially welcome. As a matter of fact, here at Central, you are just not welcome, but you're wanted. Check us out during this week on our YouTube channel, Facebook, Instagram, or website for prayer, to listen to past sermons, to listen to our weekly LCU sessions, and other ways that you can connect with us. Please. Take time to do that. We also want to remind you of a brand new student page for teens and parents. We want to hear from you and hope that you can join us. Last week's message was a powerful one as we learned how to strengthen discernment through spiritual taste. Stay with us today as Pastor Zamore takes us deeper into the Word of God as we continue on this series on spiritual boot camp. Please enjoy the time with us. Now, stay tuned for weekly announcements here at Exciting Central Tampa Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the exciting Central News Network. Excite Student Ministry. Students and parents, we're excited to unveil a new student ministry website and social media pages. For info on small group meetings, events, and parent resources, visit the website at site.centraltampa.org forward slash excite. Don't forget to follow and subscribe to ECTBC Excite on Instagram and YouTube for the latest social media updates. We can't wait to connect with you. Men's Fellowship. Men, gather with us at 9 a.m. on Saturday, September 26th via Zoom as Certified Chef Red, that's Freddie Robinson Jr., shares some of his tips and secrets to preparing his famous, I mean famous barbecue. You'll also be sharpened by a discussion on the ministry of presence in a racially divided country. That's led by Dr. Leon Battle. For more details, please visit Central's website. Coffee, tea, and conversations. Ladies, if you missed any of the previous sessions, you now have two more opportunities to connect for a time of testimonials, discussion, laughter, and fellowship. Coffee, tea, and Conversations is back for two more sessions on Saturday, September 26th and Saturday, October 3rd. Grab your cup of coffee or tea and join us on Zoom from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. You don't want to miss it. And those are today's announcements. Remember, you can replay this announcement at any time via our Central app. You can download the app from our website, or search for Exciting Central Tampa Baptist in the App Store or Play Store. Remember that God loves cheerful givers and you can give by three methods. One, go to www.centraltampa.org and click the Give Now link. Two, simply by texting Exciting Central to 73256.
three, mail any contributions to our physical address at 2923 North Tampa Street, Tampa, Florida, 33602. Thank you and God bless you. All right, all right. Good morning, everybody. Are you ready to praise the Lord with me today? This is the day the Lord has made. Now, come on, I need some worshipers this morning. I need somebody who is in love with the Most High God. We're going to lift up some hallelujah praise. Is that all right this morning? Come on, put your hands together. I want you to turn your music up. If you're at home, online, I want you to crank your speaker up this morning. Don't worry about your neighbor. Don't worry about who's in the next room. I want you to give God all his praise because he is worthy. The song simply says, hallelujah, you are worthy to be praised. Whether you know it or not, he is your portion. He is my strength. He is everything. So let's worship him. Come on, hallelujah. Hallelujah, you're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah, you're worthy to be praised. Come on, put your hands together. Hallelujah, you're worthy to be praised. Let's lift our hands this morning. I lift my hands. I praise you. I praise you, Lord. Come on, I bow my head to you, God. In holy head. honor and reverence. I honor you, Lord. I lift my hands. I lift my hands. I praise you, Lord. I bow my head. Come on, let's lift our hands in the sanctuary. I lift my hands. I praise you, Lord. I bow my head. Because I honor you. I lift my hands. I praise you, Lord. Because you are worthy. saints i want you to lift the praise this morning if you are breathing if you are able to move your hands and your feet that means you've got a reason to bless him come on he's worthy i want you to sing along with us hallelujah you're worthy lord come on everybody Hallelujah, 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 we praise, oh, we praise 
keep praising him. Oh, we're just getting started. Come on and lift him up. Everybody, Lord, we live. Lord, we lift you up. Hallelujah, you're worthy. Hallelujah, we praise your name. Hallelujah, so worthy. He's so worthy. is so good you ought to think about all the things he's brought you through but guess what he's taking you somewhere this morning and it starts in your praise so come on and sing Lord we lift you up hallelujah you're worthy hallelujah we praise your name I can't help but hallelujah, praise your holy name hallelujah Lord we lift you up Come on, if he's good, you ought to be praising him right now where you are. Amen. Oh, we serve an awesome God. So good that no matter what it is we're going through, that we, he still deserves praise. Am I right? If you know that our God is that good, I want you to just begin speaking. I want you to declare how good he's been to you in your life. So if he's been worthy, I want you to just say, God, thank you for your worthiness. Thank you for being faithful, no matter where you are. Just begin declaring that and speaking that. It's okay, there's no one to judge you. Just speak it, speak straight to God. Say, God, thank you for your goodness. Oh God, you've been so good. We worship you, hallelujah. Lord, you are good. You've been so good. Lord, you are good. You've been better than good. I can't praise you enough. I owe you my life. Can't praise you enough. Even if I tried, cause you've been, oh, sing with us, say, oh, he's been, say, you've been, you've been so good. Can you say, he's been, say, you've been. Oh, so good, so good to me. Oh, if you agree, I want you to sing it with us. Say, Lord, you are good. It's simple, just say, you've been good. Oh, Lord, you are good. Oh, he's been better. I can't. No matter how many hallelujahs I sing, it's not enough. That's how good God is. The God that we serve is that mighty. If you know it, just sing with us. Say, you've been, oh, you've been so good to me. Oh, take it up, say,
is out there God is good if he's good then you know what we don't stop the praise because he's been too good he didn't stop on us he didn't stop on you he didn't stop on me because listen there were times when I stopped on him and I shouldn't have there were times when I turned away from him and I shouldn't have there were times when I gave up and I didn't need to because he's been my strong tower the Bible says he is my portion my strength forever I know what that means somebody out there knows what that means when you got nothing else you've got God and when you realize you've got God you've got more than everything because my Bible tells me that with God on my side he's more than the whole world against me oh, I wish I had a witness oh come on that's the kind of great God that I served this morning so if you will agree with me, I need you to lift up a shout of praise 
like never before, knowing that God is going to do more and exceedingly more than what your mind could have conceived. Or don't play with him. If you hold on to that and believe it, you will know how great God really is. So come on, let's give him some praise. He's great. He is an awesome God this morning. He can do more than our minds can conceive. So don't look to your left or right and worry about what's going on. You look straight up. Fall on your knees and let's give him the praise he's worthy of. Come on and put your hands together. Just keep worshiping with us. Come on, the greatest. The greatness of the Lord is inconceivable. The love that he shows is unconditional. The power of the Lord is unbeatable. Great is the God we serve. Come on, let's sing it again. The greatness. The greatness of the Lord is inconceivable. You see the love that he shows. It's unconditional. And greatly to be praised. To be praised. Oh, I know. God is great. Oh, yes, He is. And greatly to be praised. All right, sing that verse again. The greatness of the Lord is inconceivable. The love that He shows is unconditional. The power of the Lord. Sing it like you mean it this morning. And greatly to be praised. Oh, I know that God, God is. is great. See, I tried it for myself. And greatly to be praised. And I know that I know God, God is, is great. Yeah. And greatly. And greatly to be praised. To be praised. God is great. God is great. Oh, come on and get it. And greatly to be praised. Oh, God is great. There's nobody like him, no. And greatly to be praised. Nobody can beat him, no. So great, I can't say it just one time. Say it. God, God is great. great. He needs all of that three times. God is great, great, great. Oh, come on, I missed you one more time. Three times. God is great, great, great. God is great. God is great. All right, now listen. There is a name. There is a name. I love to hear. Music is music in my ear. In my ear. 
like going on ah it's so good the goodness of God the goodness of God just just stay around musicians for a while the goodness of God but uh, even before oh I forgot I have a mask on oh wow <laughs> you know that masks are part of your life when you Take a drink of water and forget you have a mask on. You know that a mask is part of your life when you spit and you forget that you have a mask on. But today uh, I am just joyed, joyed, joyed to ask my wife, uh, Michelle, the first lady, to come and welcome and say a few words. Uh, Michelle. The joy of my heart. Put your hands together too. Amen. Love you. Love you. Hallelujah. Good morning. It's been a while, and so I thank God that I can be back in his house again. It's always so good to see his children serving him and praising him, even with the mask on. You can see your spirit, and you can see that you worship him in spirit and in truth. It's always so wonderful to be here. Um, there's something I'd like to share with you this morning, and it's kind of on a personal note. I didn't prepare anything to say, but I want the Holy Spirit to speak with me, through me. So um, bear with me for a moment. Um, Holy Spirit, come. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, come. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, use me. Holy Spirit, give me the words. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, prepare hearts. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. So I've been kind of missing for a little while, for a minute, and um, I shared with you some time back a conversation God had with me when he told me, he asked me, why am I so comfortable with pain? I was like, what are you saying? And he said, why are you so comfortable with pain? And it took me a while. I was in a car accident, and for about a year, I just took the pain from the um, accident and it was just part of life it was normal and God told me pain does not come from him and so I said okay I'm gonna work on it so I went ahead and I had surgery October and then I had a second surgery in March um, I'm still recovering still painful but I am recovering I'm doing so much better thank God and so it made me think that I am just so comfortable with pain. I expect pain. Pain is part of my life. It is part of my identity. 
But that's not part of God's identity for me. That was an identity that I claimed growing up. And so, and this is really personal. I learned this from Sister Marius. He said, be transparent. So having been in pain for so long and not being able to do the things I, I normally do, I went into a depression, real bad depression, debilitating depression, where I couldn't even get out of bed for days. But God is good. And God met me there. And God kept me. He talked to me. He helped me. I mean, there are times when no one can understand the pain you're going through. But God. And so I thank him for that. Um, I tried medication, but it takes a while for medication to work. It takes about a month to get into your system. And then if it doesn't work, then they start you another one, which takes another month to get in your system. So it's, it's a long process with that. But I thank God that I am where I am today, and I'm doing much better. However, God still isn't finished. Because I'm thinking of physical pain, but God said pain. There is childhood hurt in my life. There's pain that I've kept growing up. There's pain that I've accumulated over the years. There's pain in marriage. There's pain raising children. And that has been part of my identity still. And so that is the latest thing that God has started to work on me, is the emotional pain. The who I am pain. What has made me who I am today kind of pain. And so God is doing a great work in me. And I want to thank you for being patient with me because I have not been able to fulfill my role as First Lady or as sisters to you in Christ or even as a friend for a while because it's just been God and I. And that time, he has been working on me. He cannot use me as a clean vessel if I still have pain inside. He cannot use me if I still have all these memories and all these hurts and all these triggers. He wants a clean vessel that he can fill, that he can use for his glory and honor. And so that is the stage that I'm in, and I wanted to share that with you. And I want to say if there's anyone who is going through anything, please reach out to someone. There's so many wonderful people in this church, so many wonderful sisters in this church who are just willing and able, and believe it or not, have experienced a lot of the things you have. I often say that there's nothing that can happen to me that can't happen to you and vice versa. We're all humans and we're all exposed to the same things in life. So be encouraged. I want to bless you and tell you that God knows everything about you. Jesus has taken your pain. He knows it. He has taken it. He has borne it. And he's there with you. It is the sweetest name in the midnight hour when you call. You hear people talk about these things growing up. You hear the older people talk about it in the midnight hour calling on Jesus. But it's not till you experience it that you know when he says he is there with you all the time. That's when you know that you know that you know that God loves you and God, his promises are true. And so I want to thank him and I want to thank you. And um, God bless you. For some people, words like these may come easy. For my wife, it took a lifetime. You are hearing a lifetime revealed before you, now made available to God, that God would use it. And I thank God so much. Thank God. God is a good God. He is a great God. He can do 
anything but fail. He has moved so many mountains. I out of my way God is a wonderful God it's a God he is a good God he is a great God. He can do anything but fail. He has moved so many mountains. Out of our way Out of our way God is A wonderful God is A marvelous God is Wonderful God. Father, I thank you for you, just for you, for who you are, not just what you have done, but for you. And today, as we look into your word, I ask for your grace. I ask for your favor. I ask for your presence. And for all who have been through something and for all who are going through something, the guarantee we have is that our God is good. And that he has decreed that all things will work together for our good if we love him of this we are confident so I ask for your presence and power as I go into your word and I thank you so much so much for Michelle Rojas that you have given into my life to be my wife I love her and I pray that your goodness to me in granting me this wonderful person will help me to become who you have carved out in your purpose for me to be in this life in Jesus name I pray amen thank you so much Let's grab your Bible, if you will stand with me, grab your Bible, grab your Bible, make sure it's facing front, grab your Bible, pick it up. My spirit is God breathed. God's word is God breathed. Therefore, God's word gives me life. I am ready to hear it. I am ready to heed it. I am ready to be transformed. Hallelujah. Be seated, please, in the presence of the Lord. Uh, welcome to, again, to a spiritual boot camp series, a series designed to help us exercise or practice our spiritual senses. Paul talks about being mature 
and those who are mature are those who have their senses exercised to discern. And Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14 has been our springboard text for the series. It says, but strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so we are doing this series called Spiritual Boot Camp. We've been doing it for quite a while. We have discussed spiritual sight. We've discussed spiritual hearing and spiritual smell. These sermons are available in the archive. You can hear them on iHeart Radio. You can see them on YouTube. You can get access them through our app. We have a very, very beautiful app, exciting Central Tampa Baptist Church app and also through our website, uh, centraltampa.org. And so we encourage you to go back and listen to them. I always encourage you to have pen and paper handy because sometimes we give a lot of information. There is more to tell you than I have told you, and I can't put all into our sermon, but hopefully uh, at some point there will be a book that people can get the information that more exhaustively. Last week we looked at the, at, we began the mini series on spiritual taste and we talked about tasting the bread of life. Uh, we looked at the physiology of taste, how taste works. We looked at the purpose of taste and we saw that uh, to taste means to discern. In the spirit world, when we hear about taste, it means to discern. We also saw that it means to trust or to believe. And today we're going to continue with spiritual taste number two, and that is tasting God, tasting God. Uh, we have already seen in the series that uh, in the physical realm, uh, the physical realm has its root in the spiritual. It actually is the fruit of the spiritual. Everything you see in the physical is the, is the actual physical manifestation of what's happening in the spiritual. Everything in the physical was patterned after the spiritual. We have seen that uh, even character in the spiritual has a smell to it. Character also has a, an effulgence to it. It's beautiful. God talks about the beauty of holiness, for example. We've read about the fragrance of Jesus Christ. It, is, it smells beautiful, his presence. And, and so, uh, these senses of taste in the spirit don't, do not refer to, to, to um, putting something in your mouth. It, it refers to uh, experience. That's the third point, experience. Discernment. Belief, thirdly, experience. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, we see uh, the Bible talks about, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for all of us. He tasted. It's not by coincidence that Jesus refers to his death as a cup. He's referring to spiritual taste. It's something that he has to take in. He has to ingest. He calls it a cup. And he did not sip the cup. Taste does not mean um, sampling or sipping. No, he, he drained the cup. To its very last drop for us. He fully experienced death for all of us. And his tasting of death was the full experience of it. He literally died in every way that a sinner dies physically and spiritually. One of the most troubling passages on taste is in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4. And sometimes when you preach with scholars in the audience uh, you 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 I, I like that I, I love the challenge of having people who I know know God's word and when you come to exciting Central Tampa Baptist Church you you can't you can't preach something that's not God's word they they'll know it and they'll tell you 
And one of the young scholars that we have now developing in our midst is uh, Deacon Rashad Hines. Uh, 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 on his way to be Dr. Hines, who is now a seminary student. And I thank God for dialogue that we have and we are talking. So in case you guys don't know, he is in and he has started class. And pray for him as he goes through his classes. Well, Rashad, this here is a troubling passage. And, uh, and uh, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers, that is to partake or experiencers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they should fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucify to themselves the son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. What a passage. Very difficult passage. So the phrase tasted of the heavenly gift and the phrase tasted of the good word both refer to full participation and full experience of salvation. Full. So he's talking about people who are saved. Not people who got close enough but did not get saved and went back into the world. No. He's talking about people who got saved. And so many people who don't believe in eternal security will say this is proof of eternal security. That someone can be saved, taste of, of, of the fullness of God and they can go away. It's not talking about that at all. Quite on the contrary. This, this, this passage is, is crafted for us in the subjunctive. Uh, in the subjunctive. The subjunctive is the, is the mood of supposition. It is suggesting to the Jewish believers uh, that, that, that who wanted to abandon Christ to look for another means of salvation. And he is saying, if it were possible for this to happen, if it were possible for you to taste God and then go back, you could never get saved again because there would be no more salvation. So for those who don't believe in eternal security, this will be a nail in your coffin because it is saying, if you ever got saved and fell back, you could never come back. But he's not saying that. He's saying you cannot fall. Because if you did, there would be no other salvation. Nothing left. If it were possible, he is saying, taste and see that God is good. Psalm chapter 34 and verse 8 is going to be our verse for this morning. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. This sermon is supposed to be a participatory sermon. And so those of you present here in church, and it's good to see uh, people all through on all the aisles. Uh, it's good to see more and more of you are beginning to come back to church, and we thank God for that. We also thank God that the virus spread is has leveled off in Florida, and we look forward to see uh, it go away. But this is a participatory sermon. So if I say God is good, what do you say? And if I say all the time, what do you say? Come on, I need you to wake up this morning. God is good, and all the time. Ah, uh, those of you who are at home, same thing. God is good, and all the time. Hallelujah. To fully appreciate this text, we have to look at the entire text. What, is Paul, what was David talking about? We have to look at Psalm 34, its context. Psalm 34 was not a casually composed song. This is one of the most difficult songs that David wrote. He carefully composed the psalm to be what is called an acrostic psalm. Meaning that Every verse of the psalm begins with one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet from the first to the very last. Very difficult to compose. It was special to him because the song came during the lowest point of his life. The lowest point of his life. 
I want to let you know that often God comes strongest to you at the lowest point of your life. At the point when you turn everything over. And that's why to my lovely wife, I say that her great elevation and her great ascending to her purpose in life probably began today when for the very first time she gave you something deep in her heart that has been there that she's never shared before. When you get to that point in your life, when you get low down, I've been there. When you get to the lowest point of your life, God says that he is close to those who have a broken heart and those who are of a contrite spirit. When you get that broken, God shows up and he begins to reconstruct you. Some of you might be there right now in your life during this COVID time. Some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you have lost jobs. Some of you have had difficulties in your life because you are now sick. Some of you are struggling for your own life right now. You have gone through serious difficulties. You have been let down, abandoned and, abandoned, and some of you are alone. God is strongest to you right now. David was there. And it is through his difficulties that he constructed for us some of the most beautiful psalms of praise. Most of the praise in the Bible comes from David and most of them were written while he was sequestered in a dark hole of a cave in Adullam. Can you imagine? During your hardest times, you can praise God. You can have a song in your heart in the middle of the night. I want you to do that. I want your spirit to be so strong that no matter what you go through in your body, what you go through in your soul, that your spirit knows that God loves you and he is good all the time and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Hold on to that, that God is good. And so at the lowest points of his life, let me tell you the story. God had rejected King Saul and he had anointed David and of course word may have matriculated to David about that but at the moment that God selected Saul a demon spirit came upon uh, from the moment that, that, that God selected David a demon spirit came upon Saul and that spirit was driving him mad so that it was said to him, if you got a young man who can play skillfully, it will help you. How many of you know that praise quiets demons? It puts them to sleep. It, it paralyzes them. So sometimes I encourage people to play quiet worship music in your house just to sanitize that. They can't take that. And so... However, he, 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 he is hell-bent on killing David. And one day at supper, he managed to take a javelin and to throw it at the young boy till the javelin stuck in the wall. And David knew now he had to run. <clears throat> he had to run. Run for his life. He took off and he ran out into the night, into the bushes, and he and Jonathan had communication in which Jonathan, before he ran, Jonathan told him, uh, give me some time to determine the, the, to get some intelligence concerning the mind of my father, whether he really, or the plan of my father, whether he wants to kill you or not. And Tomorrow, I'll come to you and I will let you know if it is good, you may be able to come back or you can go home. But if it is bad, you need to go hiding. You need to go running because my daddy is a nut. <clears throat> and so they decide on some codes that they would use. First Samuel chapter 20, verse 35 to 42. Don't turn to that. It's too much. It records that for us and I'll tell you the story. And so... They, they came up with a clandestine code. Uh, if things didn't look good, Jonathan would shoot, shoot three arrows. And he would shoot one, uh, not too far, and he would shoot another one further. And then he would shoot one very far. And the, the, the trick to it was that 
he would instruct his young lad, young boy, how to retrieve them. That was the trick. So he would tell him, no, it's further. And it would allow him to, 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 to exclaim loud enough that David would hear. That was the trick. To let the boy go so far that he would have to shout out to the boy so everyone looking around would think that he was talking to a boy. And the code was that when the boy got far enough, he would say to the boy, is not the arrow beyond you? Make haste. Hurry. Do not delay. That was code to David to run, make a run for it. And so when he did that, he ran to help the boy find the arrow. He found them. He gave them to the boy and told the boy, take them into town. The boy goes and he and David alone are in the bush and they hold one another affectionately and cry. But the Bible says David cried harder than Jonathan. And then David absconds into oblivion, into obscurity. <clears throat> David is on the run. Three days passes. He has no place to go. He's still very young. He has no money, no food, no weapon. He has not eaten for three days. He has a few young boys with him. Everyone else is afraid of King Saul. So they don't want anything to do with David. But David finds refuge by going to a place that he had usually gone before when he was down. He would go into the house of the Lord. So he decides to go into the house of the Lord, which is in Nod. He goes there and he does not see the priests or the Levites. He goes straight to the high priest. The high priest is Abimelech, who is the great-grandson of Eli. And he goes to him, and Abimelech immediately panics, and he is afraid. And David says, it's okay. All I want is something to eat and a sword. Abimelech tells him, I have no regular bread. All I have is the bread that is in the holy place, 12 loaves in the holy place. That's all I have. And only the priests are supposed to eat it on the Sabbath day. And coincidentally, today is the Sabbath day. We are going to eat this bread. And then only on the Sabbath day, only the high priest could bake. In the whole nation, only the high priest. So the high priest would have to bake and replace the loaves. Those 12 loaves in the holy place were called the bread of the presence. <laughs> because... They represent God himself. God himself. And so to eat the bread meant to eat God. Jesus Christ talked about eating his flesh. He says, if you don't eat my flesh, you won't have eternal life. Therefore, you can eat God. When you eat something, that thing installs inside of you and transfers itself, its essence, its nutrients into you and it becomes you. When you eat God, God installs in your spirit and his character becomes your character. So Christ says, if you eat my flesh, my life will be inside of you. You can eat God. Spirits eat when they believe. When they accept and you believe. And so he tells him, I'm going to give it. I'm going to break with tradition and I'm going to break with the law and I'm going to give you the bread. Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, if you recall, you say, Pastor Zimmer, how do you know it was a Sabbath day? Well, Jesus tells us that because when he was walking through the fields with his disciples, he too was hungry like David, and they began to pluck the ears of the corn and eat it, and the Pharisees caught them and says, you guys are working on the Sabbath day because you are reaping. And Jesus Christ said, did you not read what David did on the Sabbath day? He said, it's okay. And so, the loaves represent the presence of God. So Abimelech gives it to David, and David asks for a sword, and Abimelech gives David the sword of Goliath, that David himself had slain Goliath and taken the sword. It was in the treasury of the temple, and he got that, 
and David now uh, decides to head out. But the entire transaction was witnessed by a young man called Doeg. Doeg. First Samuel chapter 21 and verse 6. So the priest gave him the bread, for there was no bread there but the shoe bread which had been taken from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place on the day when it was taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. That means he was under a vow and he was there uh, in the presence of the priest. And his name was Doeg, an Edomite. He was not even a Jew. He was uh, of the line of Esau, an Edomite, the chief of the herdsmen who belonged to Saul. He was the guy Saul got his horses from. He trained Saul's donkeys and horses and later became his armor bearer. Doheg heard. And Doheg went and he ratted to David, to, uh, to, to Saul. And so Saul becomes enraged and he takes his army and he marches into Nod and kills everyone in Nord. Women, children, he kills everyone in Nod. Goes into the temple and he killed 65. All priests who were part of the rotation to become high priests by the fact that they wore the effort. Everyone with an effort, he killed them. 65 of them. He told his soldiers, kill them. But the soldiers refused to put a hand on the priests. So he turned to Doeg and he tells Doeg to kill them. Doeg the Edomite slays all 65. God puts things in the Bible for a reason. We will see about Doeg in a while. Every day Saul and his army pursued David. <clears throat> and every day God delivers David. Every day. How many of you know that God has been delivering you from stuff you don't even know about? How many of you know that the devil of hell would have gotten you many times over? While you sleep, demons encroach your house. While you walk there, while you... The, I mean, you could have been killed many times over had it not been the angel of the Lord that encamped round about you all the time. God has been watching over you when you were small, watching over you as you grew up. God has been constantly caring for you because God is good. And all the time, yes, sir, God has been watching over David. And David knows that sometimes we are not grateful enough to acknowledge what God is doing in our life. We tend to think that it's us who got where we are by some ingenuity of our own, by some knowledge that we have. Rashad and I were talking about that this morning. I was not a smart kid in school at all. No, 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 no. I know for a fact that because I graduated as magma cum laude in Bible school was because God alone gave me the capacity. If you see me writing books and if you see me doing anything right now, it's not because Pastor Z is smart. I never was in school. But the Holy Ghost gifted me and blessed me. And I thank God. I thank God. Whew. This belief of the goodness of God is your shield. L listen to me. Your shield, when, when the Bible talks about the shield of faith, that's what he's talking about. Your shield as you go through life is your belief or your confidence in God. That's what faith is. Your faith is your confidence in who God is. Your confidence that God is good is going to keep you. If you ever lose any part of that confidence, the enemy begins to incur upon you and get you to double guess the nature and character and purpose and destiny that God has for you and you stuck if that gets inside of your shield, it's your confidence that God is good. Always believe that. God is good doesn't mean that God is nice. Good don't mean being nice. God is good when he judges you. 
God is good when he whooped me. He was good. When your parents spank you, they're good. God is good when he gives you mercy. And God is good when he gives you justice. God is good. And so when you receive from his hands things that don't look good, you just tell him thank you anyway. Because he means it for your good. God is good. And all the time. Yes, sir. But after a while, human reasoning can get in the way and human reasoning got in the way of good old David. And David does the unthinkable. He reasons, uh, surmises that God could deliver Saul into his hands through the enemy. Some people do that too. It's, it's not hard. Abraham did it. He says, I, I know God says he's going to bless me with a child, but maybe he can do it through this means. We, we all do that. We all try to help God out because he's too slow. I mean, if he said he anointed me and, and I'm the next king, come on already. And then we begin to think and think and think that God is not capable of doing what he said he can do. He may very well need our help. So he begins to help God. And that's when he did something stupid. And we all can do that. God is able all by himself. Trust me. He built everything you see when you were not even there. Didn't look at any pattern. No one gave him ideas. And so he decides to do the unthinkable. And he turns himself in. He gets rid of the young boys who are with him and now he's totally alone and he literally goes to the enemy. Some people have thought about doing that. Picking up your phone and dialing that number that the devil has been knocking on your door and sending into your phone. Some psychic to call in to ask. That's going to the enemy. Don't do that. And so here's what Saul does. He, and David does. He goes to, to, to the king of Gath. The Philistine king, whose name is Ashish, and he turns himself in to tell them, I can help you get Saul. First Samuel chapter 21, verse 10. David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and he went to Ashish to the king of Gath. But again, God allows someone to snitch. Don't, don't turn to it, but first Samuel chapter 21, verse 11. Someone snitches. And the servant of Ashish said unto him, Is not this David, the king of the land? The devil knows who you are. Isn't this the king? How does this man know that David was anointed? Isn't this the king? And did they not sing to another of him, to one another of him, dancing and saying, Saul has slain his thousands? And David, his ten thousands, that's him. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21 verse, and verse 12. Let's read that and to see the narrative of that. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Ashish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands. And he made marks on the doors. Of the gate and he set his spittle to run down his beard then Ashish said to his servants behold you see the man is mad why then have you brought him to me do I lack madmen and you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence shall this fellow come into my house and he kicked him out <clears throat> what a pitiful state to be in it's okay for your family to despise you because Saul, uh, uh, David's brothers work for Saul. It's okay for your friends to despise you. But when your enemy doesn't want you, good gracious, he's gone down low. It is, he is in an impossible place in his life. There's nobody to help him. No one now. He goes into caves and crevices. And David knows that only God, only God. 
Sometimes God will get you to a place in your life where you know that only God can help me now. That is the best place to be. Somebody listening to me right now, you may be there right now. You've gone to, for help everywhere else. And the doctors and the hospitals have said to you, there is nothing else that we can do. There was a woman in the Bible who had spent all her substance on doctors and on medicines. And one day she saw Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. Listen to me. He knew now that if God doesn't help him, he's done for. When he wrote the song, Psalm, of, Psalm 121 was talking about that. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, the Lord which made heaven and earth. He said he will not suffer my foot, my foot to be moved. The Lord who healeth thee, he will not slumber nor sleep. For the Lord is my keeper, the Lord keeps my shade upon my right hand, upon thy right hand. For the sun will not smite me by day, not the moon by night. He shall preserve thy soul even forevermore. Oh, my help. He knew that. My help. My help. All of my help. Cometh from the Lord. It's not a bad place to be. It's not a bad place to be. And so God helped him every day. Every day Saul hunted him. Every day. The mighty army of Israel hunted him like an animal. Every day and every night. And God delivered him every day and every night. Until one day, God didn't have, David didn't have to do anything. One day, guess what happened? Saul decided to engage the Philistines. And someone identified him, disguised as he was, and they shot an arrow that struck him. He fell, and so he knows that they are going to overtake him. And so he tells Doeg, Shoot me through with your arrow. And Doeg says, I can't. So David, Saul falls on his own sword. And Doeg does the same. You don't have to worry about your enemies. God will take care of them. He died like an animal. And dogs at his flesh. Listen to me. God will take care of your enemy. And so he wrote Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked upon him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him and he delivers them oh taste and see that the lord is good let's talk about the goodness of god for the rest of the time that i have no one gave being to god therefore god's goodness is underived it is the essence of his nature he was good before he made anything since the Almighty is immutable, therefore there are no superlatives to his goodness. His goodness can never increase, nor can his goodness 
diminish. He cannot be better than he is, nor can he be less good than he is. God is just good. It is who he is. Everything he does is perfect. It is said about Jesus Christ, he doeth all things right. When God made the universe because there was no one to judge his work, he judged it himself and he says, wow, very good, very good. Everything that he did, very good. Goodness, therefore, is the summation of God. If you could take all of the characteristics of God, all of the traits of God, all of the attributes of God, and condense them to one thing, that thing is goodness. That's who he is. He is just good. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18. Because God is good, goodness is his character. It is the summary of his character. And so his name summarizes his character as good. His character is good. And his glory comes from his character. The glory of God comes from who God is. In this physical life, we see glory as what people have. So we think a man is, is great because he has money. Or we see glory as what people accomplish. But not so in the spirit. Your greatness is not what you do. Your greatness is who you are. And God is showing that to me. God is showing that to me. God is transforming your pastor. He's transforming me. God is showing me the beauty of this lady right here. And, and, and it's, it is a journey I am on. God is showing me that who she is is beautiful. Who she is is good. If she did nothing else for me, I enjoy the fact that she, her soul is beautiful and good. And the rest of my life is to explore the beauty of who God gave me to do life with. That is beautiful. You need to see people for who they are, not for what you can get out of them, what they can produce or do for you or with you or to you. They're just good. God is good by giving me her and I see him through her. Exodus 33. Then Moses, verse 18, then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. Do you want to see God's glory? Do you want to know what his glory is? Show me your glory. And he said, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. That's his goodness. His glory is his goodness and his name. Moses had more revelations than anybody had. No one had revelations as Moses, but he always wanted more. From the very inception, God graced Moses with a manifestation of God in a burning bush. Still, he wanted more. God commissioned him to go and God says, take your rod. When you drop it down gloriously, a snake will appear. He wanted more. God said, take your hand, put it in your pocket. When you take it out, it's leprosy. Put it back, it's back. But he still wanted more. He said, tell me who you are. When they ask me who you are, I want to know. Who should I tell them you are? Tell me more about yourself. We know you to be El Shaddai, the God of the fathers. But God says, you know me by that name. But there's another name I'm going to tell you right now by which you shall conduct business for me. And my name is going to be Jehovah God, the all-existing one who exists to do whatever is needed. Tell them that is my name. He always pressed God for more. God saw, Moses saw God keep every word that he promised. I mean, he saw God mesmerize the Egyptians, root out the, the wheels from the chariots. He saw God part the Red Sea. Moses saw the Shekinah glory in the sky in the day and in the night. Moses went on the mountain with God and spent so much time that his entire presence shone more than the sun did. Moses saw that and yet, Moses wanted more. So he comes on Mount Sinai when God gives him the tablets of stone. And in Exodus 33 and verse 13, Moses says, Now therefore I pray you, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your ways. 
Folks, knowing God is more beautiful than anything that he can do for you. He says, I want to know you. Show me who you are, your character, your nature. I pray you, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your ways. God's name is his character and his character is glory, is glorious. What is great about God is not what he does or what he uh, is able to own. It's the fact that he is just good. Psalms chapter 52 and verse 9. It says, I will wait on your name for it is good because his name is his character. Look at Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18. Then Moses says, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. Those two things was what the glory was. My goodness is going to pass before you and I'm going to proclaim my name before you and you will know who I am and that will be an effulgence. Remember I told you in the spirit world, character has effulgence. Character shines. So angels shine because they're holy. So if an angel came into your presence and did not transform itself, you couldn't watch it because its holiness is so bright it'll knock you down. It has effulgence. So God's goodness makes him shine. It's his glory. His glory is his goodness. And so what he's saying to Moses is what all dignitaries and kings and prime ministers and presidents know. That before they make their glorious appearance before their people in a formal way, they have to be introduced. So when the president of the United States makes his appearance to give the State of the Union address... Someone has to call his name. Ladies and gentlemen, the 45th president of the United States of America, His Excellency Donald John Trump. Trump. Somebody declares, God says, since there is nobody to do it for me, I'll do it myself. I'll tell you my name. My name is good. And so God called his own name. God announced himself by con consolidating the inexhaustive character of his into one word, that God is good. Psalm 119 verse 68 says, He is good and he does good. God is good, but everything he does is good. His creation is good. It's good. Psalm 145 verse 9, don't turn to that. It says, the tender mercies of the Lord are all over his works. When you look at the creation you can see that somebody who designed that had to be good. The more closely the creature is studied, the more the beneficence of his creator becomes apparent to him. No one can truly be an atheist when you watch the creation of God. To no other creature, however, has God been so good than to mankind. We are his handiwork. He calls us his workmanship. We are his great work. Psalm 139 verse 14 says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Every atheist knows deep on the inside that he was constructed. Everything about the structure of our bodies and our souls and our spirits attest to the fact that we had a maker who was good. First, we have his own Trinitarian design. Three beings seamlessly working together. A physical being, a psychological being, and a spiritual being. All three seamlessly working together. Isn't that beautiful? Three working together. There is no evidence of any other creature that God created that has all three. The image. God is good. And all the time. Our bodies are magnificent. If uncoiled, if our DNA was to be uncoiled, uncoiled, uh, 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 the cells, uh, it would stretch 10 billion miles. If you uncoiled 
the DNA of our cells. It would stretch to 10 billion miles. That's how intricate we are because God is good. Hallelujah. In a lifetime, your brain's long-term memory can hold up to one quadrillion bits of information. No computer com can compare to you. Yet, you don't have a battery that makes you. There's no battery. I mean, God is good. You, you don't have to get plugged in to charge at night. No way. God charges you naturally and God is just good in a lifetime. Oh, glory to God. Your heart has its own electrical impulse. This means that as long as it has oxygen, it will beat even if you take it out of your body. If you give it oxygen, it beats because it has the breath of life. God is good. Your heart will also pump about 1.5 million barrels of blood during your lifetime. That's enough to fill 200 trains. God is good. Hallelujah. Your human skeleton, it's flexible. It can turn with hinges and joints that were made to move. But to cut down harmful friction, all these moving parts need to be lubricated. And man-made machines have to be lubricated. But God has lubricated our body naturally by manufacturing a jelly-like substance in the right amount that allows us to move our joints and to enjoy life and to play sports and to just have a great time because God is good. The body has a chemical plant far more intricate than any plant that man has ever built. This electrical plant changes the food we eat into living tissue. When you eat food, it transforms it for us into living tissue because God is good. The human has an, an automatic thermostat that takes care of both our heating and cooling needs. Whenever we get hot, the body's own air condition system kicks in. And all of a sudden, drops of perspiration comes over your body and it cools you. God is good all the time. In just one human brain, there is more wiring and more electrical circuitry than all the computer systems of the world combined in one brain. God is good. He's been good to us. Good to us. He created the beauty and grace of women. God is good. And he, en and he allows us to ravish our love one to another. And isn't it good? Hallelujah, God is good. And in the exercise of this beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, experience, he allows us to produce a child that is the perfect blend of the two of us because God is good. And none of it we had to buy. Everything is free. Your heart works. You don't even know how it works. Your liver works. You don't even know how it works. You don't make anything that is important work. None. Every part of your body works without your consent. Because God is just good all the time. Ah, glory to God. He's good because he gave us his word. When Adam sinned, Adam was sequestered from God. Human beings were cut off from God. But God sent his word, sent prophets to us, sent apostles to us, sent teachers to us, took 40 men across years to construct 66 books that contain his will so that you can get communication on who he is. Gives you dreams, gives you vision, because God is good. Never left you without a witness because he is good. And above all, in the fullness of time, he sent forth his own son. He gave you the best. He didn't send an angel, Gabriel, to save you. No, no, no. He came himself, taking upon himself the form of a servant, a slave, coming in the likeness of human flesh through the canal of blood from a woman's womb to be born and to to be born in the, in, the, in the effulgence of a pauper, 
who had no money. He came wrapped in swaddling clothes. Lived a life that was not luxurious. And when they looked at him, there was no beauty in him that anybody should even desire him. But he came and he lived a perfect life and died to pay the penalty for your sin and was placed on a cross and experienced the worst death that someone could experience. And even there on the cross, he was forgiving. Even there on the cross, he was loving because God is just good. Rose from the dead. And he didn't become a human for just a while. Ever he lives. He's always going to be a human. Forever he's going to be a human being. So he can intercede for you. So he can intercept every bad thing that will ever happen to you. So that he has already predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. The whole deal is done already. You will never lose that salvation because he has sealed you already until the day of redemption. Everything is done till he presents you to his father, a perfect bride. You know why? Because God is God just like that. He's hooked you up. All things will work together for good. No matter what happens in your life, it must come good. Child of God, do not despair. Child of God, do not in any way become disparaged or discouraged because you are a fellow who is good. He's just good, 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 good. It must come good. No matter what's happening in your life, you have the victory and you are going to conquer because you are more than a conqueror. You have a God who is good. No one will ever separate you from the love of God. Nothing's present, nothing's past, nothing's to come, not heights, not death, not principality, not powers. Nobody can mess with you. No one can bring any charge against you. No matter what sin you commit, you are already forgiven in Jesus' name because no charge can be brought in the court of law against you. You have diplomatic immunity because you are an ambassador because God has already sealed your destiny. God is just good like that. Woo! He's just good, 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 good. Those of you listening to me, God is good. He's been good to you. Ah, God is good. And most of all, he gave you the Holy Spirit inside of you what the holy spirit does for you is that he brings the presence of god inside of you the bible says we have the fullness of god when you partook of god by believing jesus christ you ate god and god's was installed inside of you and now his substance is now becoming you and every day you are being transformed from glory to glory and for all eternity you'll be coming more and more and more like god ah come on this is beautiful yes 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 god lives inside of you the nature of god is inside of you you have the nature of the eternal God living inside of you, coming out, trying to come out, trying to come out. Listen to me. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel, but you are not an earthen vessel. So I am learning as a child of God. Don't make my assessment of people based on what their earthen vessel looks like. That was the vanity of my pride. God has showed me it's not about that. I need to see the God in them. If I can see the Jesus in you, I love the Jesus in you. I am not looking at things spiritually. I am seeing the love of God all over the world. God loves you. If you've never trusted him as your Lord and personal savior, I want to let you know, he's knocking at your door. Behold, he said, I stand at the door and I am knocking. If any man hears my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and supper with him. I'll make him eat. I'll give him something to eat. God wants to satisfy every hunger that you have inside of you. God wants to satisfy you with himself. Many of you have chased money. You have chased careers. 
you have chased all kinds of experiences and yet you are empty on the inside because what you really are looking for is God. God. And sometimes he has to reduce you to nothing by stripping away everything else but God. And if you find yourself there today, broken and contrite, I say to you, God is near to you right now. Accept him as your Lord and personal Savior. Accept him. Eat right now. Come to the table. It is free. It is free. Tell him, dear God, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. I believe that he is the son of God who came down to die, was buried, and rose again, and ascended into heaven for my salvation. I accept Jesus Christ. I eat him now. I accept him into my spirit. I want his spirit to give me life to give me eternal life and to transform me into his character. If you need help with that, just type prayer. Those of you who are online, just type prayer. Someone will contact you to help you get a personal relationship with God so that you can begin to experience the goodness of God. Those of you who are Christians, I say to you, learn to be grateful. Learn to be grateful. Sometimes in our prayers, we ask God for too much stuff. We just ask, ask, ask. Begin to praise God and thank God. And in the environment of prayer, in the environment of praise and thanksgiving, God will perform for you so much more. Come on, let's stand, please. Let's stand, please. Let's have an invitation. And, and, and I know sometimes because we are online that we, we are sort of catering sometimes to a camera. I don't want this to be the case. I want us to go back to the experiencing church, whether there's a camera there or not. There's an altar. There's an altar. Come, come, come before the altar and do whatever business with God. I want you to thank God. Look at your life and thank God for where you are. Even if you not, are not where you want to be, be grateful for who you are. Even if you are not yet all you are supposed to be. I want you to thank God for the wife he gave you. Thank God for all the blessings he gave you. Thank God for the health that you have. Thank God for the people he's put in your life to guide you. Thank God for the church that you have. Thank God for the job that you have. Thank God for all the things he is doing. When you begin to thank God like that, he performs more and more for you. Don't just weary him with your requests. Be grateful. Be thankful. He killed all of them in the wilderness because they grumbled. They were ungrateful and they grumbled. But if you are grateful and you thank him, thank him when he chastens you, thank him. Probably, I would say as I end my last word, I am most thankful to God for the weapons he gave me. Folks, listen to me. I am thankful to my parents for the weapons that they gave me because I would have become something that not very nice at all. Not just the candy and the stuff they gave me. When they whooped me, it was an act of love. And some of you have an issue with God because you see things in the world that are awry. And you are blaming God for the solid consequences of human sin itself. But God is good and sometimes through these consequences, he brings us to our senses so we can go, transform our life and move towards his purpose. Thank God for the pain in your life, the brokenness in your life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's go ahead and sing, please. And you can just pray on the altar for yourself. Thank you. Oh Lord, I am so grateful. grateful for the victories we won. Thank you. Thank I you. Could go on and yes. On. 
long time ago had it not been for God you were so ignorant and arrogant I was so ignorant and arrogant had I been dead a long time ago jeez but God 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 has been good even when you mess up God is good Father I come to you right now thanking you for everyone who is present today and many more in the loft above. You protected us. No one who anointed their door in obedience to your word got COVID. No one. You kept that word because you are good. You are good. We thank you even when you chasten us. Because you chase every, every son that you love. I thank you for the whooping very much. I thank you for the people you put in our lives. To guide us. To embellish us. Thank you for the men of God. Who give me access to them and camaraderie. Thank you for parents in my life. So for those who have come today. I think they just come to say thank you. thank you. I pray that you'll bless husbands to be tender-hearted to their wives, to be soft-hearted, all of us, to be good like you, to be good, to be good like you. Transform us into your good nature. Father, I don't even want to ask right now for anything. I don't want to ask for anything right now. All we pray for now is that all of your goodness will come to us and nothing will, 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 will withhold it. Every barrier remove. Every spirit that is not of God remove. Anything that eclipses your goodness from coming to us remove and that alone is healing that alone is shalom fullness wholeness wellness I don't even want to define it we want your fullness manifested in this body that you gave us this I pray on behalf of everyone who has come I pray shallow your goodness and for those online we love you and we just thank you God is good all the time I said God is good all the time hallelujah thank you thank you
bless you. Go with you. May his goodness go before you and give you rest. <laughs> <laughs>